knowledge that prepared me for life. Something that a book, something that a school could never have taught me. Life taught me. I wake up happy as six-time world champ, two-time Hall of Famer. Got my man Brad Gilmore here with me. And we're coming to you live from the MGM Grand and Hotel and Casino. Getting ready for a big fight going down this weekend, actually. It's going to be here in a minute. Uh, Sebastian Fandura uh, taking on Tim Zhu. Uh, can't wait for that. Rolling Marrow versus Isak Pitbull Cruz. Cannot wait for that. It's going to be some hot, highly anticipated action going down at the T-Mobile Arena. On Saturday night, man, you don't want to miss out. You don't want to get shut out. And I'm just glad. I'm just glad we're here uh, for the festivities. Um, I, I always love, you know, coming to the boxing, being up close and personal, almost like Frank Sinatra back in the day when he was, you know, taking photos of uh, a Joe Frank and Muhammad Ali. And I was like, man, I want to be like Frank one day, man. That was, that was always, it's always my goal to be like Frank one day. And uh, boom, and now we're here, you know, up close and personal. Uh, with the fight game so man I'm, I'm loving it man but uh how you feel man how you feel yeah i'm feeling good too book mgm grand shout out to y'all we're actually in uh the, the king's suite so y'all can't see this is a, a, a two level no the stairs <laughs> whirlpool there's ain't actually an elevator ain't that, ain't that, but y'all bell don't believe that <laughs> okay so you ain't about no to, hey you ain't about to get me dropped look yeah. <laughs> but it, but in all seriousness i remember uh, when we were out here for row one night in vegas um, y'all had that big suite, you and Sean Mel. Yeah, remember? Yeah. Mm -hmm. And we had the after party here. Now, just to just so y'all can <laughs> see how a real high roller rolls, like that after party, we had all our guys, some of the Vegas crew guys who were there. And so there must have been what 50 people? Oh, yeah, yeah. It was, it, was, it, was, it was a big party, man. In the room. Like, like it was enough room to do it. You know what's crazy? Uh, all these years uh, that I've been coming to the MGM Grand, I didn't even know they had, you know, rooms that had balconies. I didn't, yeah. I didn't know that at all. And then, and then when uh, Charmel, I don't know how she got there. Hooked. I you know what? I don't know how much money I spent for that. <laughs> and I'm glad. <laughs> because I probably would have been like, baby, what were you thinking? But now I heard we got the discount rate. Right. I don't know what that is. I don't know what that is. And I didn't even ask. And uh, for all you married men out there, don't ask. Okay, <laughs> I'm just giving you. Don't some, look at the some, bank statement. Don't even, don't even do it. Don't even do it. I just, made that mistake. Just, just don't ask uh, because uh, there's all kind of stuff being audited that you don't know about. There's all kind of stuff, <laughs> yeah. you know, coming in that you, you wonder you know, what this come from. You know what I mean? You know, it's like my wife. I had a, a Louis Vuitton uh, bag, um, and, uh, and I was happy with it. I got it from um, Korea when I was over there and bought it for $25. And uh, it's just like the real bag, right? And uh, I, I had no problem with this bag. And for some reason, Charmel did not like me walking around with this bag. So one day. <laughs> Charmel's watching. So one day, Hi, Queen. So one day she, well, she about to hear this story then. So one day I came home 
I don't know if it was my birthday. I can't remember what it was, but it was a brand new Louis, just like the one that I had. Okay. And um, I'm like, oh, smoke it, baby. Hook it, hook it, baby. I'm appreciate it. It was one of those type of deal. So I took the bag. I went on the road. And then one day I just happened to be reaching in and pulling some stuff out. And the, re- and, and the, the sticky came out of how much it was. Oh no! I almost lost my damn mind. You're like, I hope that's yen. Oh, <laughs> it had cash on it and everything. And I'm like, oh no, oh no! I'm, I almost went into shock, you know, when I saw that. But uh, but it's cool. It's cool. Don't look. Don't yeah, ask. Don't do all right. Just giving you some friendly yeah. advice. <laughs> but no, we know we're excited to get for the fight, Fundora and Timzu. Timzu. Now, the, the other thing I wanted to say, you mentioned Frank Sinatra. And yeah. wanted to be frank, I was listening to something with a soon to be at, at this time next week. Uh, yeah, a week from today, Paul Heyman's going to be in the Hall of Fame. Mm-hmm. And I never knew how he got his start in the pro wrestling business. I just heard an interview he did. You know how he got his start? No, no. So he bought a camera and went to Madison Square Garden. And somehow he was in high school and somehow finagled his way in to be a photographer for the show that night. And as he's walking to go to the ring to go take pictures, he looks in the hallway and he sees Vincent J. McMahon, Vince Sr. and Andre the Giant talking to each other in the hallway. And Paul said, you know, I've just thought this is a great moment. He said, I had my camera real low and I took like 30 pictures real quick and then ran out of the room just to maybe I would give one good one. He went home and developed the film, had these really awesome pictures of Andre and Vince. So the next show, he goes back to take pictures and he gives, he frames up one of them and goes and gives it to Vince Sr. And Vince Sr. is like, oh, these are pretty good, kid. You know, you uh, working your way through school. He thought Paul was in college. And then um, he's like, oh, yes, sir. Yes, Mr. McMahon. And then he said, like, old school Vegas style. He, like, shook his hand and he gave him, like, a $50 bill, right? And he goes, that's uh, to be your transport, you know, to you know help go buy you some books for school or something like that. And then um, that's how Paul broke into the business. And every yeah. every every month he'd come back and take pictures, and Vince would pay him off yeah. 50, 50 bucks. And yeah, I, yeah, I heard I heard a little bit of that uh, story as well as uh, him being a photographer. I, I didn't hear that story before. But yeah, man, you got to know how to you know get in. Sometimes, sometimes you got to finagle your way in. Um, I always tell my students, you don't have to actually know how to do it. You just have to act like you know how to do it. <laughs> And very, very well. Uh, and you might, uh, you know, might become some. So, no, nah, man, I get it, man. I was going to the Hall of Fame. Big ups. Yeah, and he said, kind of like what I think that you did. Now, again, when you were in the Hall the first time, I didn't, I was just starting, I think, in reality wrestling. So, I don't, I don't, I don't think I got to talk to you about it. But Paul said he's going to go out there, read the room for his Hall of Fame speech. Yeah. And kind of, he's like, I'm going to wing it. I'm not going to write anything down. Yeah, yeah. Now, did you write your first Hall of Fame speech or did you just go out there and kind of had, you had your bullets that you wanted I had to my, I had my bullet points. Um, actually, uh, I, I didn't do the prompter or anything like that. I just went out and just, you know, felt the room, felt the, the vibe and um, tried to um, just deliver. I had really, really no uh, real direction other than my my finish, and it's almost like a match. <laughs> you know, you start from the finish and work your way back. And um, so I, I pretty much kind of like took that approach. Um, I, I knew exactly my finish was going to be um, all about Charmel uh, more than anything, and it was going to be rap, a rap after that. You know, we was going to go home. You know, so um, no, nah, um, a lot of guys go out and read that prompter, and I feel like that's got to be hard much more harder than actually going out there and feeling it. I, I would imagine it, it, it has to be much more harder than, it, than going out there and just feeling it. Well, also, too, like your strengths as a, as a wrestler you is not reading from prompter, right? Like, yeah, yeah. hey, you got 60 seconds to cut a promo, go cut it. You yeah, know what I mean? And yeah. you're not thinking, okay, let me read the script off the prompter. Yeah. And for people who've never read off a prompter, it's not the easiest thing in the world to do. No, it's not. The it's kind of difficult. You know what? I can read a ticker a whole lot better than a prompter. Like you mean like one that yeah, goes across yeah, the bottom? Yeah, going across the bottom. I mean, those are so easy for me compared to actually doing the prompter. Yeah. I don't know why. You know, Prompters are hard. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I can actually feel it a whole lot more on the ticker. So anytime I'm working, uh, and if I can get, uh, like, you know, like doing, uh, you know, um, 
uh, WWE biographies or something had to have a prompter. I was like, man, can you, can you guys work the ticker? <laughs> you know what I'm saying? We can work that a whole lot better. <laughs> you know what I mean? <laughs> and uh, and uh, sometimes they will make it work for me. Yeah, yeah. yeah. So it's going to be interesting to see Paul Heyman. He's going to go in and he says he's going to call it in the ring. He's got to see what the vibe of the people are going to be. Yeah. And I'm sure they're going to let Paul do whatever whatever he wants. But hopefully he won't have one of those um, Janet Jackson earpieces like Taker had. Because if that happens, we're going to be there for a while. <laughs> I, like I said, when Take came out and he had the, the you know, the Madonna Janet Jackson microphone, I said, okay, we better sit down. Oh, yeah, yeah. This is going to be a minute. Your cold and, uh, get <laughs> you might even want to get a pillow to blame because we're going to be here for a minute. But there's going to be a lot of speeches there. Like, I, I still don't know um, who's accepting the Hall of Fame induction for Muhammad Ali. I don't know if they've announced it yet. I saw that The Rock's grandmother is going into the Hall of Fame this year. Uh, she was the, the wife of the high chief, Peter Maivia, and ran the whole promotion. Okay. Kind of the, I think, from what I was reading about her biography, one of the first female promoters. Yeah, I heard that before, yeah. yeah so she's going to be going in. I'm sure that The Rock's going to have something Maybe to do with that, I, I yeah. imagine that he would. Thunderbolt Patterson. Uh, Thunderbolt. Who's going to be um, um, inducting him in? I don't know who's doing his speech, but I hear he's going to be there to do the speech. Oh no, he's going to be there. Yeah. I know somebody. But I, I heard. I heard um, it was going to be someone not in the wrestling world, not someone in the entertainment world, just some. I don't know. Somebody that's close to him. Okay. Uh, I, I can't remember who, it, who who they said it was. I was reading it and it just slipped my mind. I'll, I'll look it up during the break here. Uh, but, yeah, man, I, I think that the Hall of Fame this year is going to be awesome overall because the thing is you, you have Ali going in, Thunderbolt Patterson, um, the U.S. Express, uh, Paul Heyman. Uh, there's some I'm forgetting. Who else is going to go? I mean, whoever it is. It's, uh, Hall of Fame is always a great night. You yeah. know what I mean? And you have much love and respect to the legend Hillbilly Jim. But, you know, uh, we can't have too many hillbilly speeches. Well, I'm going to tell you right now, Charmel, she's, uh, she's psyched. Um, I know she's out there. She's listening. I know she's psyched for it. She's probably going to be, um, you know, best dressed in the room. So all you ladies out there that's listening to the show, you better come prepared. You better come with your best, though, uh, because uh, it's going to be a contest. It's always a contest. Yeah, that's, that's, I tell my students, uh, don't think that you're not being tested all the time. You are being tested all the time. So, guys, uh, you better, you know, be, be suited and booted. Because I know I'm going to be looking real fly, man. I'm going to be looking real good. Uh, but uh, the ladies, y'all better be tight. Uh, but we got to take a break, guys. You're in the Hall of Fame. Stick around, y'all. We'll be back in a minute. Can you dig it, dig it, sucker? It, sucker. sucker. And this episode is sponsored by Blue Chew. Guys, let's talk about it. Let's talk about sex. Hey, you remember when you was always ready to go? I'm talking about strapping the rocket on it, man. Going straight to the moon. I'm talking about getting it done. If you want that extra confidence, I got something for you. Listen up, Blue Chew. Com. Blue Chew is a unique online service that delivers the same active ingredients as Viagra, Cialis, Levitra, but in a chewable tablet at the fraction of the cost. But the great thing, Book, is you can take it any time, day or night, so you can plan ahead or be ready whenever an opportunity arises. The process is simple. You sign up at BlueChew.com, consult with one of their licensed medical providers, and once you're approved, you'll receive your prescription within days. The best part, guys, is all done online on the internet. So there's no doctor's visit, no awkward conversations, no waiting in line at a pharmacy or any of that. And the thing is, book Blue Chew's tablets, they're made right here in the USA and prepared and shipped direct to your door in a discreet package so no one is the wiser. You know, let's just get it out there, guys. Blue Chew wants to help you have better sex. Discover your options at BlueChew.com. It, it's like this. Chew it and do it. And we've got a special deal for our listeners. Try Blue Chew absolutely free when you use promo code Booker at your checkout. Just pay $5 for shipping, man. That's BlueChew.com. Use promo code Booker to receive your first month absolutely free. Visit BlueChew.com for more details and important safety information. And, you know, we want to thank Blue Chew for sponsoring the Hall of Fame podcast. Chew it and do it. 
Boom! Welcome back inside the Hall of Fame, man. We're coming to you live from the MGM Grand Hotel and Casino, live from Las Vegas, Nevada, baby. Getting ready for the big fight going down this weekend. Tim Zhu versus Sebastian Durer for the 154 fight supremacy, man. Who's going to walk away with all the gold, baby? As well as that, my, my, my man uh, and that, that co-main event, Roly Romero. Hard hit, uh, dynamite in both hands, but he's going to be taking on a very, very crafty Aesop Pitbull Cruz. And I, and I tell you, uh, I just one of those fights for me. It, it could be the main event. I know Keith Thurman dropped out with a bicep injury. Hopefully, uh, Keith Thurman will come back um, 100%, get right back in the mix um, because I was highly anticipating that fight then going down uh, with Keith Thurman just to see uh, that, that fight right there, I think, with Thurman. In Tim Zhu, it was going to be a fight of IQs uh, more than anything. Even though um, Ben Getty, um, the uh, the trainer, um, God rest his soul, for Keith Thurman, always said, "Believe in your power, son. Always believe in your power." But I thought it was going to be a, a chess match uh, more than anything. Uh, but, but this fight, uh, Fundura, Tim Zhu, it can't be nothing but a one of those rock'em sock'em robots. Um, slow. <laughs> Slug fits, man. Um, it's gonna be like uh, in a phone booth. Neither guy is gonna be doing a whole lot of rubbing, rubbing. So uh, this fight, man. Uh, I'm excited. I'm excited. Uh, yeah, live uh, from the uh, T-Mobile Arena, going down Saturday night. Yes, it's gonna be great. Yeah, shout out to MGM for the accommodation. Shout out, to, uh, shout out to everybody who makes it possible. Yeah, Steve and, and and the whole crew for making this happen. Oh, sure. Um, you know, we were we teased it on the radio show yesterday. And um, I wanted to bring it up to you today because Bleacher Report is doing their top 50 WWE superstars of all time, right? And they um, the, the list is up to, I think, number 21. They haven't dropped the top 20 yet. But I will tell you this. Your name has already sprung up in the, in the, in the 50 through 30 cat or 50 through 21 category, mm. okay? It's already come up. Now, how do you feel, first off, about lists in general? Like these lists that, that outlets make. Do you think that they're accurate? Or do you think that they're it's too hard to just say these are the best ever because there's so many quantifiers? Now they gave some criteria. Do you want to hear what the criteria is? Yeah, no, no. Oh, oh yeah, go ahead. Go ahead. Then I answer a question. Okay. Well, hey, make sure you keep the mic in front of you. No, my bad. My bad. <laughs> um, <laughs> my bad. Uh, no, I was thinking when you were I know. <laughs> You're deep in talk. Okay. Here's what their criteria is. Historical significance. Okay. Do they have a meaningful impact on WWE history? Championships. Were they among the most decorated in the company's history? Popularity. How over was the superstar with the WWE's fans? Needle mover. Did they make meaningful differences in the ratings, ticket sales, and overall time active? Was the superstar successful over a sustained period of time? Pay-per-view appearances, were they fixtures on the biggest shows in WWE? And then skills, in-ring mic charisma, were they more than just a wrestler? Did their skill set stop at the microphone? Were they charismatic? So those are the qualifiers. That's the case. I should be number one. <laughs> they, okay. I'm just saying. I mean, I'm just, I, I should be in the top five. Um, but um, what number you said was? So I haven't got to your number yet, but but what what do you think of these lists in general? Uh, you know what, man? Um, I always wanted to be um, among the greatest wrestlers in the history of the game. Um, I'm always wanted my name to ring, you know, with the, the guys that really went out there and performed at a really, really high level. Um, so for me, it means a lot. Um, uh, I remember, you know, studying the Nick Bockwinkles and, you know, the Ric Flairs and the JYDs of the world and saying, man, I want to be able to be like those guys. I want to be a you know, real, real player. In the game, I want to be a shaker um, and mover in the game. Uh, I want to be able to leave a legacy and a history behind as well. I never thought about championships or anything like that. I just want to be among those names. So yeah, yeah, it means a lot. Um, you know, to be, to be a part of that fraternity, um, I guess you could say. So when you think about how many, I mean, there's been. I mean, I would venture to guess to say thousands of people who've come through WWE? I mean, is it in the thousands? Oh, man, it's right, it's got it, right? Yeah, yeah, yeah. I mean, it's like thousands, I mean, the tens of thousands. Of I mean, of, of people who, you know, come through and wrestlers, even if they've done one shot yeah, or what yeah, have you, what yeah, have you. Yeah. So to be in the top 50 is interesting. Now, the other qualifier here that we have to make sure is said before I reveal the list, and tell me 
if you think that this affects your uh, ranking because this is based just on your on the, everyone's WWE career. So if you were outside of WWE for a point and then came in, or if you you know came in and left, they don't include so any of that. Your, uh, career in WCW is it's not another no, no one cares about it. Well, this list doesn't care about it. Okay. Okay, this list is not factoring in anybody's outside of WWE ranking. So what I want to do, I well that might make my ranking go down. Right, I, I can see that. Well, yeah, I mean, WC, you're the most decorated star in WCW history. So, <laughs> so, gonna hurt yeah, a yeah. bit. But this is what they said. For example, the majority of Ric Flair's 16 world title runs were won won away from the company and were not taken into consideration in the countdown. Okay, so I'm gonna start with number 40. All right. And I just want you to hear, I'm going to read them through and then we can talk about it. Is that right. cool? Okay. Number 40 is superstar Billy Graham. Number 39 is Rob Van Dam. Number 38 is Owen Hart. Number 37 is Mr. Perfect. Number 36 is Dave Batista. Number 35 is the ultimate warrior. Number 34, Ricky, the dragon steamboat. Number 33 Booker T, number 32, Jake the Snake Roberts, and then number 30. Oh, they have, they, they stopped 32. Okay. So there you go. So you're between Jake Roberts and Ricky the Dragon Steamboat above superstar Billy Graham, Batista, Mr. Perfect, Owen Hart. Uh, how do you feel about number 33? You know, I, I, I could take that. I'm not going to uh, sit here and say, um, you know, I mean, just I got to take that. Because if perfect is higher than you know, I mean lower than I am. That's come on, you know what I mean. That's 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 high company. Um, I mean, you're above Ricky Steamboat, somebody who I admire, uh, somebody who I always want to be like um, Jake, another guy who was so you know intelligent as far as the, the wrestling game goes. Um, Superstar I, Billy Graham, Billy Graham, Graham. All, all of those names is exactly what I uh, strive to become. You know, when I got the wrestling business, I want to be. I wanted my name to ring with all of those type of guys, and, and that right there, those those are what ten names. Uh, mm -hmm. That's that's some great great company for me to be in. So I'm not going to sit here and complain one bit about uh, that company that I'm uh, you know sharing you know uh, that, that 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 ring with right there. Oh man, great great company. If if they did consider WCW, right? Do you think your top five? I know that's a hard thing to answer. You know, because I feel like everybody know, watching the chat right now. I mean, there's there's a case. It's really hard, it's really hard for me to answer that question, but uh, but I could refer to Matt Hardy. Matt, Matt Hardy said, you know, um, as far as qualifications go, Booker T, you know, perhaps is the greatest wrestler that ever put on a pair of boots, <laughs> and that's that right there. That, that's high praise. That's high praise, I mean, I, and I appreciate, you know. Um, him saying um, something like that about me. Uh, do I get my uh, my just due, my, my my full amount of credit? I don't think so. I don't think so. I mean, that's um, that's to be expected, though. That, that, that what do you mean? Well, um, that's you know, people say, man, man, that's not fair. Yeah, and I go, man, life is not fair. You know what I mean? You can't expect everything to be fair. You know, that's just not the American way. You know what I mean? So, I mean, you know, deflate, gate, all that. I mean, it, you're going to do whatever you can, you know, to win as well as you're going to root and cheer for the ones that you like the most, you know, and I, and I get that. I've, got, I've had a lot of praise, you know, from my fans throughout my wrestling career. And I've always never tried to, you know, just cater to, you know, one group or one, you know, section or anything like that. I wanted it to be all inclusive as far as when I went out there and performed. But I do understand when I went out on with certain guys and just say first was baby first baby first was baby face, you know, Sting versus Booker T. You know, I, I knew he would get the most cheers in that match. And it was and, and there again, it was to be expected. Um just because, you know, uh, you know, that's just the game. That's just part of it. We play it um and we play the hand that we're dealt. And we try to, um, you know, do the best with that. You know what I mean? But life's not fair. Life's not fair at all. But as far as um, this list goes, am I going to be, um, you know, you know, one that's, you know, walk around, you know, with his, you know, 
head down because I'm, you know, the group of the, the greatest, you know, performers in the history of the game. Hell no, man. I'm going to take that to my grave. I'm going to take that to my grave and say, wow, man, I did that. I did that, um, which was something I really thought about when I first got in this wrestling business. It wasn't about the money. It wasn't about the fame or anything like that. It was about going out there and being the best performer in that ring, night in and night out, um, no matter what, no matter what, night in and night out, I wanted to be the best. And, I, and a lot of those guys, they heard me say it, man, you know, go follow that, go follow that. You know what I mean? Because uh, I wanted to truly be the best in um, titles, championships, you know, caviar dreams just comes along with all of that. We got <laughs> we got to take another break, guys. Uh, you're in the Hall of Fame. We'll be back in a moment. And it's Booker T, six-time world champion, my man Brad Gilmore from Manscaped. The performance package 5.0 Ultra is here. And let me tell you, it's got futuristic tendencies included in this bundle, guys. Brand new Lawnmower 5.0 Ultra, the Weed Whacker. 2.0 ear and nose and hair trimmer and essentials aftercare products like the Crop Soother, the Ball After Shave Lotion, and the Crop Preserver, anti chafing ball deodorant, and two free gifts. Oh, yes! That's right, Book. Their fifth generation lawnmower features two interchangeable next gen skin safe blade heads, a standard one for taking a little off the top, and a new foil blade to go smooth wherever your heart desires. And did I mention it's waterproof too? Manscaped, they did us a favor, Book. All the listeners of the Hall of Fame, and they threw in two free gifts the Boxers 2.0 and the Shed 2.0 toiletry bag. Resolutions may come and go, but a well-groomed you is here to stay with Manscaped's latest and greatest. Yeah, and start the new year off right, because when you look good, you feel good. Manscaped help you sculpt the best version of yourself for the year ahead. New year and new you and definitely a new trimmer. Manscaped you got your grooming resolutions covered. Guys, get 20% off and free shipping with the code Booker at Manscaped.com. That's 20% off with free shipping at Manscaped.com. Use the code Booker. Happy New Year to your balls. Welcome back inside the Hall of Fame, man. Just chopping it up. Coming to you live from the MGM Grand Hotel and Casino. Getting ready for the big fight going down. This weekend, uh, Sebastian Van Der taking on Tim Zhu, 154 pounds of supremacy, as well as Roly Romero taking on Isak Pitbull Cruz. Uh, man, uh, it's, it's, going, it's going down. Fireworks is going to be going down live from the T-Mobile Arena uh, on Saturday night. Uh, I can't wait. I can't wait. I'm telling you right now, I'm going to get suited and booted, and I'm going I'm to be uh, all up in the house. And it's gonna it's gonna be good. I can't wait. I know we got a lot of super chatters coming in too, so we're gonna get. We, to you we guys. do have a couple. I, I did want to ask because we are live, and today we're gonna get the um, the first official SmackDown of the Jade Cargill era. All right, she's she's officially a SmackDown superstar. My thing is this: you don't bring Jade on SmackDown the week prior to WrestleMania unless she's got something to do on WrestleMania. That's what I feel like. Right. So um, and we still don't know several. I think there are several like things still kind of up in the air regarding WrestleMania, um, like where are people going to be, you know, who, who's going to be in this what match and what have you. Um, I, I, I'm excited for what's going to come in the women's division, because the thing, too, is post WrestleMania, I feel like they're going to have to shake things up a bit. You know what I mean? Oh, yeah. They got to oh, yeah. shake things up. They got to put a little more on Raw, put a little more on SmackDown, split the rosters, maybe call up some people from NXT and what have you and have a meaningful thing. So do, my question, though, was going to be this, because I don't know what Tiffany Stratton is doing on WrestleMania. I don't know what 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 Bianca Belair is doing on WrestleMania. I don't know what Naomi's doing at WrestleMania. Jay Cargill at WrestleMania. Uh, uh, there's a few other names of women. Zelina Vega. I don't know what they're doing at WrestleMania. So do you think that there might be some multi-women match? Well, I remember when I showed up on uh, WrestleMania and I didn't have anything to do. It was like the, it's pretty, the Battle Royal. 
You know, that's, that's, you know, I won the battle roll. You did. And, uh, you know, that, that match actually was one of my uh, WrestleMania highlight moments. Yeah. <laughs> I would say. At WrestleMania uh, 2021. Yeah, yeah. And, uh, and uh, yeah, yeah. So I, I, I can see something like that happen. It's a lot of um, talent right now that's just um, waiting on what they're going to be doing. WrestleMania, and then a lot of people aren't even uh, figuring into the equation at WrestleMania. So to be able to, you know, hot shot it and get everybody a little piece of the action, I, I love to see um, see it happen. Let me ask you that WrestleMania though, and then we have some, we'll get to our super chatters. But um, is it is it deflating? And I hope you don't mind me asking this, but is it like somewhat deflating when like you're leading up to WrestleMania and there's not a clear plan for you, or is it like I know I'm getting on the show, I'm just gonna I'll be patient. Like with like the, the battle royal. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I mean, that's some um, angst, angst as far as um, anxiety as far as um, yeah. Man, you want to get that check, right? Because that, you know I mean, that's that, a big check for you. Know, like, back in the day, I don't know how it is now, uh, but back in the day, um, yeah, you wanted to be on the show because that was a huge check for you. Uh, the higher uh, you you were on the car, that was just you know the way it was back then. So. I know when uh, I showed up and, uh, and I didn't have anything for me uh, for that WrestleMania. And then they created, you know, the battle all for me to actually get in there and, you know, get a little piece of the action. I was happy about it. I was, I was like, oh, yeah. Okay, here we go. Uh, and that's just the way it is. Sometimes you, you, your, your spot changes, you know, you're not going to always be in the main event. You know, you're not going to always be, you know, high on the card. You know, that's just part of it. Everybody's get a, a certain turn and whatnot. And I just always looked at it that way. Yeah. Because to me, um, the check at the end of the day is probably the best thing about WrestleMania. Oh, yeah, yeah. And again, I hope I'm not prying. No. So, so if I am, you can just cut me off. But um, when you open the WrestleMania check, like especially against some like a, like a 19 or a 20, you know, where you're, you know, you know, and you're in a tag team title match in 2019, you're in main event for world title. Like, are you like, oh, all right? It's I only really thought about the the check, but Hunter, that's the only, yeah. the only check I really thought about. Uh, as far as really wanted to see what it was, because I, I had heard about those checks. Yeah. You know, and then when I saw it, I was like, okay, <laughs> here we go. Was, was it, can I ask you this? It Was it like the biggest single oh, it was match the biggest check, single check ever? It was the biggest single check I ever, uh, single check I ever got um, in the wrestling business. Yeah, yeah. And it was enough to, you know, take care of a lot of things. It, it was a monster. And you hear about, you know, the Hogan checks. You know, WrestleMania checks. It wasn't that big. You know, wasn't holding no, no, but it but it was it was it was good enough. It was good enough for me not to complain about. It. <laughs> you know what I'm saying? Can I ask you this too? Like when because I've heard certain guys say it out loud on, on shows, so I don't think I'm I'm speaking out of school here, but some guys have said, Oh, I looked at my payoff and I wasn't happy with the payoff and I went and complained. Yeah. Um, did that ever cross your mind? Did you ever like, oh, I need to go complain? No, no. Uh, and get no, more? No, no. I was always compensated properly. And I, and I always feel You feel like you always paid your worth. Yeah, I, I really do. Um, and then you you, you got to understand in this business when you're making the, the kind of money that you know, a lot of guys make it, you know, when I was doing this as well as now, you know, uh, you got to know how to manage. You know, I always looked at, you know, you know, you, where well, you're going to make that kind of money anywhere else. You know, I'm not gonna talk. I'm not gonna say how much money I made WrestleMania, but it was a it was a substantial check. Um, to where it could pay for a lot of people's houses. Yeah, wow. You know, so you say, you know, where am I gonna make this kind of money doing this? You know, I never, I, I never imagined a dream being able to make that kind of money in the wrestling business. Um, because I used to do it for ten bucks, twenty bucks. You know, fifty bucks was a, a damn good payoff. You know, when I was coming up and then, you know, when I started making a hundred bucks, I was like, wow, man. And, and I went to WCW and they wanted, they offered us $75,000. And, and I go, wow, you can make that kind of money doing this. You know, and it was like, yeah, you can make that kind of money doing this. You know, and so I was like, so for me. Uh, 75 always, a year. Right? Yeah, 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 yeah. So yeah. I always tried to figure, you know, say, man, I'm going to try to, you know, take this money and, and manage it properly. And hopefully I'll come out on the other end, you know, uh, a lot better than I started. You know, uh, but I could have played and, and perhaps I wouldn't be here talking to you right now. Probably the biggest, like, well, I'm sure there's other businesses this way, but like at the lowest end, making $10 a match. But then once you get to WCW, making $75,000, I don't know if there's like a bigger disparity in any other business. Do you know what I mean? Like going from making crumbs to yeah, yeah. the next level is. No, and I had a regular job money. too, and I was making $15,000 a year. 
And um, but I, when but you I, were at the warehouse, yeah, yeah, um, yeah well, and I was a department complex, but, but I had a free apartment, right? Um, as yeah, well, huge. so so that helped me out. That's a lot. huge. That was a nice, you know, jumping change that I was making. But you know, I was only making you know cash like fifteen thousand dollars a year. You know, so for me to go from making fifteen thousand dollars a year in an apartment to making seventy five seventy five thousand dollars a year, I was like, wow. And then that seventy five went to like a hundred, and then it went to like a hundred twenty five in like a few months. So I was like, man. I never, you know, thought about, you know, you can make that kind of money uh, legally <laughs> in my life. <laughs> you you know? probably saw some guys make that kind of money. Oh, but... <laughs> yeah, yeah, but it wasn't legal. It wasn't on the up and up. Yeah, yeah. So for me, uh, to find myself in that position, yeah, man, you know, I say take this money and try to manage it and manage it properly, you know, 99%, you know, keep your mouth shut 100%, speak up 100% of the time, but you might get fired, you know what I mean? So no picky battles. Yeah, you know. For me, I will say, um, I and I've had payoffs for certain things. Not to, I'm not talking about in wrestling, uh, like WrestleMania or anything like that. Obviously, but like, I'm always, I'm always like, okay, like this is. I, I never think to complain. I guess is what I'm saying. Yeah, yeah. I've never thought about that. Yeah. But perhaps I could get more money, <laughs> more money if I can. Well, play. no, I mean, no, I mean, I would say, um, you know, complain about. I mean, just ask for more. Ask for more next time. Yeah, that's all. That's all you do. You just ask for more next time. You know what I mean? Uh, you know, ask and see. They give it to you if they won't. You know, we see what we can get. Yeah, it's one of those types. When, when you hear like people, and again, I don't know why I'm asking all this, but like when you hear people complain at all, like back, in, I'm saying back in the day, was there like was there like whispers in the locker room, like oh hey such and such went over to the office and got more. Maybe I should go do that. No, nah, I mean, no. Nah. Nah, or y'all didn't talk about your payoffs? I never really, yeah, we never really talked about payoffs or anything like that to each other. Uh, it's just not. Is that part of the business? Like, Well, it's just not something that, you know, you can find yourself really, you know, chasing your tail, you know, saying, you know, I need this, I need this. And, and the thing is, if you, if you, uh, if you're going to get it, if, if it's, it's going to come to you. I mean, if, 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 if you're that guy in this business, it's, it's going to find its way to you. It's just part of it. You know, I never went chasing, you know, for contracts. I never went chasing, you know, you know, you know, for spots. You weren't politicking. Never politic once. I always said, man, just give me the script and let me go out and perform and show you how good I am. And most of the guys that are really, really good, they don't have to do a whole lot of politic. And they really, they really don't. I mean, most of the guys that are really, really good, they they don't really think about their spot or anything like that. It's, they just don't. You know, and uh, for me, um, I'm not bragging or anything like that, but I never really thought about my spot or anything because I always showed up. I always was very, very professional. And and every time you gave me, you know, a job to go out there and do, I was going to go out there and do that job and do that job to the best of my ability and try to surpass any, anything that you ever thought uh, with that one little thing that we were going to do right there. So for me, um, it's just always been about performing and, you know, the guy, a lot of those guys that complained, you know, we don't hear about them anymore. We don't see them, you know, that, that complaint may have been very, very brief. I know we got to take a break, but I remember one time in Disney, uh, one of the guys, uh, we were having a meeting and one, and one of the guys who was an underneath guy, he raised his hand. He goes, you know, well, I think the underneath guys, you know, you know, need to, you know, get paid a little bit more money. You know what I mean? And I remember, you know, the boss said, you're fired. Get him, out. <laughs> Get him out of here. Stick around. You know, I'm afraid we'll be back in a minute. <laughs> She's a business owner and a former beauty queen. She sure is, and she also performed with the godfather of soul himself. Now, she's changing people's lives. Charmelle Huffman doesn't do this for fame or fortune. She says it's what we all should do to help each other. And I was honored to sit down and talk with this incredible superstar for our 2024 Remarkable Women finalists. I am Charmel Huffman, and I am co-owner of Reality of Wrestling. Charmel Huffman's mission with her husband, world-renowned wrestler Booker T, is to change the world of wrestling and change lives. So hopefully their dreams can come true like ours did. Huffman's own dreams began in 1991. I was at Spelman College majored in math, and uh, all of a sudden became Miss Black America. It led her to the godfather of soul. That was an amazing three and a half years of my life. A young girl from Gary, Indiana, and I was able to literally travel the world. You know James Brown was a legend. Then to success with wrestling and induction into the WWE Hall of Fame. My father used to always say to me, to whom much is given, much is asked. And 
I've always felt that desire to give back. Through the Booker T Fights for Kids Foundation, she's given out college scholarships, backpacks, helped single moms, women with breast cancer, and veterans, and even filled 18 wheelers full of hurricane supplies. There's a need, we tend to step in. And we, and we do it quietly. We, we don't want the attention, we just want to help. It's important because somebody took a chance on me. So for me to be nominated for this is just extraordinary. And you can watch Reality of Wrestling, which airs right here on CW39 Sunday mornings at 1 a.m. And to learn more about Charmel Huffman and all that she does, head to our website, CW39.com. We're CW39 Houston. No wait weather and traffic. Boom! Welcome back inside the Hall of Fame, man. We're live from the MGM Grand Hotel and Casino. Uh, you're a big fight going down tomorrow night, man. Um, Sebastian Van Dura is going to see if he can go in there and take that championship, take that strap off of Tim Zhu, 154-pound, um, you know, supremacy, as well as Isaac Pitbull Cruz versus Roly Romero. That fight's going to be awesome as well i can't wait um as well as the 40 year old cuban american dream mm. irish landy i always like saying that right there it's a good one irish landy uh yeah yeah uh, i'm gonna be in action as well so i'm gonna get there early that's what's up tomorrow guys all big moments we're gonna be doing some live streaming as well from the fight so uh make sure you guys be tuned in uh to fight night it's gonna be some hot hot action going down well, let's get to some of our super chats here before we wrap the show up for um for the week. Now, this comes from Preston Davis. Preston Davis says, "Peace and love, family." Boom. Well, we appreciate you, Preston. That's a good one. John J I D nine nine nine. Booker, what makes a good referee and a bad referee? What qualities in a ref made you want them out there refing your matches or not? This is a great question that I think we could spend a lot of time on, but um. What makes a good ref and a bad ref? Or let's just say what makes a good ref. Yeah, yeah, let's just, just go that route right there. Good ref, um, you're not going to know he's in the ring. You know, he's always going to be um, on his job, but you're not going to really notice he's there. You know, he's not going to be in your way ever. Um, for me, um, the referee for me, Rob Meyer, uh, that probably refed 85% of my matches was Nick Patrick. Referee Nick Patrick in WCW. Then when he came to WWE, he refed a lot of my matches too. Uh, but uh, he was a guy that I could always go to. He was a guy that I could always trust. Um, you know, when you're in the ring, of course, it, it takes two to tango, but you really need three to really be able to get the job done, man. Uh, and for me, I would use Nick Patrick so much in so many different ways in the matchup. Um, I remember... Uh, Nick Patrick, uh, he took the bump in the, my championship match against Rey Mysterio. Right, yeah. And uh, he took the biggest bump in that match. He roll, hit out, went out, roll, hit, and then turned the flip <laughs> and laid there until he had to make the three count. And everybody over on that side was looking at Nick Patrick because of the performance he had pulled off, you know. One of the but uh, that's what I, I look for in a, in a referee, a guy that can actually go out there and uh, be seen but unseen at the same time. Now, would you go as far as requesting certain people for your matches? I've heard that before. Like, hey, can you put Charles Robinson on this match? Or can you put No, anybody? no, I would not be requesting Charles Robinson for anything. Uh, <laughs> you know, he, does, he can mess up your whole career. He's still getting eaten for it. He can mess up your Sorry, Charles. Career. Yes. Um, yeah. uh, but, but but would you go as far as requesting people? At yeah, the time? Yeah, yeah, yeah. I mean, uh, Brian Hildebrand, uh, God rest his soul, he's a, a referee uh, that used to ref a lot of my matches, man, and his antics was like totally over the top. You know, I so miss uh, Brian Hildebrand. And like I say, uh, Mickey J. Uh, I used to like Mickey, Mickey J. Uh, oh, yeah, well. Mickey, yeah, and, yeah, yeah. And Nick Patrick, like I say, Nick Patrick was a guy that I always requested. Uh, to work my matches and it seemed, seemed like it it be just it just became the norm in WCW for Nick Patrick. I don't know if he may have uh, requested that match because uh, he was senior pa uh, referee Nick Patrick. Was well, the senior yeah. man? Um, you know, I also think the things I will say as a fan that I like as a referee. The referee's got to have a, a distinctive three count. Okay. Yeah, yeah. You just name one guy, Nick Patrick. Very distinctive three count. He was kind of low with it. He didn't really come far back. He was kind of low and he kind of sidearm it a little bit. You yeah, know what I mean? Yeah, yeah. 
Now, Earl Hebner would come all the way up and over. Yeah. He'd come all the way up and over, yeah. and he'd really give you that dramatic three uh -huh. count. Yeah. Those are the ones that I like. Yeah. And and I like because for a while, WWE went away from it where you wouldn't even hear the referee's name, and you wouldn't even know anything about the referee. Now they say the ref's name more, and they like give you a yeah. little bit yeah. of personality. Yeah. I like that yeah. because I like when the ref's got a little personality. And the two guys I just mentioned, Nick Patrick and Earl Hebner, they had a match on pay-per-view against <laughs> yeah, each yeah. other. That's what they got over with uh, the fans as refs. Now, you know what? I always thought, honestly, I always thought I was one of the best refs in, in wrestling. <laughs> oh, saying? wait, no. Oh, this is the booker. Oh, this is the booker, you know? <laughs> you got to you gotta pop it. And you know what I mean? I remember having the boys crack it up so hard. When I was doing that, you know, playing special guest ref on the road. Because you did like a, a whole tour as a referee. Yeah, right? yeah. The boys, they got so caught up in that three count. It was the best, man. I was like, I like somebody's going to steal this. I know somebody's going to steal it. You know what I mean? Because it's good stuff. It's good stuff. It really is. Yeah. So, and, and I think a lot of people don't know how intimately involved and important the referee is, especially for television wrestling. Um, you know, very important. Oh, I, mean, I mean, so important. Yeah, yeah. So much that that referee's doing. Um, this one comes from John. Uh, what's your favorite cheese? Craft. Uh, like just know, like American craft, craft cheddar? Single, craft singles, man. Yeah, so you're, like, you're like a cheddar guy. You know, I tried to have the Alveda singles, and I thought they were actually uh, pretty good for a while, but the um, the uh, craft singles is something uh, I'd say, man, it's to go to. It's something I grew up on, I think. Yeah, you yeah, know, yeah. My, mama, my mama used to have those craft singles, you know what I mean? And, you know, sometimes, you know, when you're in the hood, you know, grilled cheese sandwich is all you might get. <laughs> grilled cheese is a, is, a, is, a, is a delicacy, especially oh, yeah. in the South. A little butter. A little butter. A little butter. On butter, butter on both sides. Yeah. Uh -huh. You know what I do? I put two slices of craft in the middle, right? Yeah. And I kind of make them to where they're like this. You know, they're not stacked right yeah, on top yeah, of each yeah. other. They're kind of like that. Yeah. And then I take a little sprinkle cheese, sprinkle it on the top of the bread uh -huh. before I put it in That's there. too much tip. Nah, much man. Tip. It's great. That's, too That's much great. Tip. What are you talking about? Yeah, too much cheese. You're all clogged up eating that much <laughs> cheese. <laughs> but you're not like a you're not like a Gouda fan or I like Gouda. feta. I like Gouda. You like yeah, feta? Yeah, yeah, I like the bacon, egg, and Gouda. I like yeah, the feta uh, cheese. I'm uh, a big feta guy. I like, I like feta. You know what I mean? But yeah. look, but I'm I'm an American cheese guy. You know, I'm yeah. American. I'm American made. You know I mean? <laughs> I'm a big Feta fan. I'm a Feta fan. What can I say? Uh, Callie Toenail. What up, Callie? Good Friday and happy Easter oh. to all. So does anyone get the Nation of Domination vibes from The Rock? I can see going that way like he did with Farouk. Um, I think what he's referring to is when he was in the Nation and then kicked Farouk out of the Nation and kind of took over. Yeah. Yeah. Um, I could see that. Actually, I don't see that, to be honest with you. Yeah. I see it going the other way. Like a turn happening, but not so much the rock taking the bloodline. You know, the rock turning on the bloodline. I can see that. That's what I see more so. Yeah, I can see that. But I don't know. Again, I've, him going he was the best idea for him. Well, I it mean, was the best idea. I think being backed in the corner was the best thing for the whole Russell Man. I agree. You know, and, and I think um the right decision was made. I agree. Um, um I think night one and night two is turning out to be uh, something that everybody's going to want to tune in to see. It could be a spectacle. Um, uh, just the uh, just the stipulations. Yeah, I oh, guess. that alone. Well, I just like that, that what happens at the end of night one is going to lead into the end of night two. Yeah, yeah. And that, just from a television viewer, now i got to watch it. I mean, I gotta see what's going to happen. Know, I mean, um, just earlier in the gym, you know, guy, you know, who you got, Cody, you know, <laughs> is Cody going to do it this time? You know, and I hope so. It's one of those type of deals, you know, so everybody's anticipating WrestleMania and how this thing's going to, uh, you know, play out. For me, um, like I said, I don't like writing the show or anything like that. I just like sitting back, watching it and, and seeing how it play out just because I am a true fan of the game uh, more than anything. Uh, but, uh, but um, I like how this thing's playing out. It's going to be awesome. I'm looking forward to it. Tell me what do you think about the level that Cody is over that is with the fans. Well, As a baby face, I, wanna, well, I just want to ask this question real yeah. quick. As a baby face, mm -hmm. and not like a 
for example, CM Punk style babyface, right? To where you're a little anti-authority, you know, a little edgy. Like to use the old school wrestling term, the white meat babyface, which is Cody Rhodes. Yeah. But he's so over with fans. Like that's got to be difficult in this day and age to achieve that, don't you think? Like to achieve that kind of stardom. Yes. Yeah. Just just being the white meat good guy babyface. Well, Cody, you know, he's not trying to reinvent the wheel. He's just going out there and performing at a very, very high level. He's trying to make his promos interesting. He's trying to make you feel something when you're watching it. He goes back to the promo that Dusty Rose talked about back in the day. Mm -hmm. He's doing nothing any different than that. It is working. Um, he's one of the most over guys uh, in the business right now. And I think he's more over, one of the more over guys in the business, of I think, because of what he did outside of WWE when he left. Had to be. I really feel like he, he he really really needed that, and I think that's is what put Cody Rhodes in this uh, position now to where he is looked at as a bona fide star. No, we got to get out of here. But I've heard guys say that you know Cody Rhodes is like cool and all. He's you know I don't think he's cool and all. I, don't I think, think Cody people knows. are you know uh, you know uh, getting caught up in the story of what's going on right now. And like I said earlier, we we got our favorites. We got what we like. And that might be what that is, but I do know this. If and when Cody Rhodes finally crashed that glass ceiling, the people going to go nuts. Bottom line, that's what's going to happen. I don't think it's going to be one of those fair weather things. I don't think it's going to be like one of those fly by night things or anything like that. I think that moment is going to solidify what this business is truly all about. We got to get up out of here, man. We do. I want to thank everybody for stepping inside the Hall of Fame today, getting your champagne, wishes, caviar, dream, bread, all the heavy lifting. Uh, we got to, we got a big fight going down Saturday night. We got to get ready. Uh, but uh, like I say always, man, peace. We love you. And we out.